Okay, so, um, you know, this is our, uh, from Brightwater, um, obviously we're a recruitment specialist, um, we work in um, 17 different verticals across loads and loads of different industries, and this is something we feel very, very passionate about. Um, CV and interviews, it's kind of one of the uh, one of the pillars of recruitment. Um, but I suppose why would a CV be very, is it, would that be uh, interviewed? Um, one of the main pieces is it'll help to showcase what your top skills and qualities are. But it also helps employers to make decisions on their hiring. And some of these can be quite big decisions. And it is the fir definitely the first step in uh, securing a, an interview. Um, so really the structure of a, uh, of a CV is very, very important. And it absolutely sets the tone for future engagements. Um, and Emer Walsh is going to run through an awful lot of this uh, over the coming half an hour, 45 minutes. Um, the next step, as we say, we're saying the CV and the interview press are, com interview, um, are completely intertwined. Um, and the interview, it, it, what it effectively does is confirms the suitability of the applicant. Who's the person behind that CV? You know, and some of the things that become very, very important are in that communication skills, confidence, can you sell yourself, um, social skills and body language, all these things feed into the, uh, the interview. So we're going to cover an awful lot of topics today um, and we seem to have nearly everybody in the room. So I just have a quick brief introduction of uh, Imer Walsh. Imer is uh, one of our, sorry, he's an associate director uh, here in um, in Brightwater has over a decade experience. So it's say, it's probably safe to say that she has seen everything and anything and everything in between in recruitment over the last uh, over the last decade. Um, so hopefully she's gonna share um, uh, an awful lot of that with you guys today. Um, so without any further ado, I just say, as you're any questions, make sure to pop them into the into the question box and we will get to them as we can. Um, so Emer, over to you. Yeah, so thank, thank you, Gordon. Yeah, over a decade, almost 15 years, I think, now in, in recruitment. And I've recruited across um, a number of different industries. So sales and marketing, retail, banking, insurance, compliance and legal. So I suppose what we're going to go through today probably covers the general type of interviews and stuff like that. However, for each industry, it can be a little bit specific. So I suppose I would caveat that some of the, the stuff well. we're going to cover. Well, maybe actually what might be a good starting point is before we delve into that, how is the how is the market feeling at the moment? And because obviously CV and interview is very very important. You know, it's only one side of a of a you know relationship with employers. So how how do you, how do you feel the market is at the moment? So the market is actually quite good. Um, obviously March April time things really did slow down a little bit. People weren't really sure what was going to happen. However. Um, I suppose the world needs to go on, the economy needs to go on. So what we're finding is actually it is particularly busy at the moment. Traditionally, September, October is a really good time to be looking for a job. And this September and October have been no different. We've probably seen about a six or seven percent increase in the number of jobs registered with us over the last couple of months. Um, so it's certainly a good time to be looking. Um, I suppose when you are committing to, to looking for a new job, it is very important that you commit to it. It is a lot of work, it's time consuming. Um, and I suppose that's where engaging with a partner like ourselves, using a, a specialist recruiter to help you in that process can really, really um, save you time and also improve your performance. So that is what we're, we're gonna be covering off today. So I'll just, just fly into the, um, I suppose the, the topics for today. So first of all is how and when to actually start looking. Um, is there a best time of the year? As I said, this time of the year is good, January equally so, um, but it is time consuming. So you wanna make sure that you're fully committed and you are ready to actually start that process. I suppose first things first, your profile, creating a CV, looking at your LinkedIn profile and also your social media presence. So we're gonna cover off a little bit about that. Then next, we're gonna look at what you need to do before the interview. And that's probably one of the most important parts of the process, how you get yourself prepared. You may have the best skills in the world, you may have the best CV, but if you can't sell yourself in those 30 or 40 minutes during a first interview, you're never gonna be able to succeed at this. Um, so we have some really good tips and tricks for that. Then a little bit around the interview day, and actually I'm probably gonna focus more on remote interviewing at the moment. Um, sorry, today, because that's obviously what we're seeing at the moment. It's about 95% of our clients have shifted their whole hiring process and interview process and onboarding process onto the remote side of things. So a few, few new tips and tricks on that end. And then really how to handle the post-interview feedback and how to follow up with, with clients. So um, first things first, we are looking at a sample of a good CV. Um, so again, 
there isn't any right or wrong way to do things. However, there's a few tricks that you really, really want to get right when you're looking at your CV. So first off, um, I suppose the first comment on this, this is a made up CV, so there's no data protection issue here in terms of, of sharing anybody's details. You'll see here at the top, the, um, I suppose the, the contact details are very clearly visible. Um, email address, phone number, you would be surprised how many CVs we have received that may forget to put on a mobile number or have an incorrect mobile number on it. Um, so double check all of the information. You'll see here the um, profile is the next part of it. Um, and that's a really important part of the CV. This is almost like the cover letter of the past. So it's something you would tailor for every single CV that you're writing. And in it, you're really just highlighting a couple of lines about your, your skill set and your experience and why you're suitable for the particular role you're applying to. Um, then the next piece is obviously the major achievements. And again, it's really important to give some time and thought to those. Your academic qualifications, um, again, limit this to bullet points. You don't need to include every exam you've ever done or every result you've ever gotten, but really keep it to the end of year exams or the overall results. And then obviously you're going to cover your career history um, from there in chronological order. You'll see obviously the font is the same the whole way through. Keep it professional looking, keep it black and white um, and ensure, I suppose, that the, the, the layout is really, really clear and really, really professional. So Next thing Eber, here. Just, yep. just a quick question on that. I think when um, you look on the uh, on the profile section, you're trying to um, sell yourself. Is it mo is it more important to have the more recent achievements in it, or um, how do you how do you decide going about on your on your on your profile? So what I would say, Gordon, it's probably important to include what's relevant to whatever the job is that you're applying for. So I would actually advise nearly tailoring that profile and key achievement sections for every application you're making. It may seem a little bit tedious, but you want to take the job spec and see what's important to this particular company. You know, is it to have the exam results? Is it maybe to have tested a particular system or have project experience? So again, you would tailor it towards the application you're making. And even if the experience is going back a few years, if it's relevant to that application, if it's not on the CV, the client isn't going or the company isn't going to know it and they may not call you for interviews. So I think you just need to be very specific each and every time you're doing it. Okay, so even if you might be super proud about something, if it's not relevant, it's not relevant. And being relevant. being that this is that this is the bit to get you in the door, and then the other stuff you're super proud about that'll come into in the interviews. Yeah, and I suppose the real tip with the CV is it's something that is going to act as a conversation starter in the interview. So you don't need to put the full story in in the CV, but if you have something there that the company is actually going to pick up on, they will ask you that question in the interview, and therefore it's much easier for you to actually sell yourself during the the interview as well. Um, so the next point here we have actually is just gaps on CVs. So a lot of people have taken time out, they've gone traveling, maybe they've gone back to do further study, whatever it is. But if there is maybe anything further than maybe three or four months of a gap on your CV, be sure to, to, to actually highlight what it is, um, just not to set off any alarm bells for, for a company. Um, hobbies is something else that comes up. Some people don't bother including them anymore, but I think it's a really good way to get your personality across. But be honest, obviously, if you haven't read a book recently, don't say that you're an avid reader because you might be asked, you know, tell us about the latest book you've read or whatever. And then the last one there is also kind of similar to your question there, Gordon. It's it's the same idea. The other skills that you might have, the other skills may not be fully relevant to the job on offer. However, it's things like languages, computer skills you might have developed that actually the company may have a requirement for in the background that you don't know about. So it's again, anything and everything that you have that's relevant professionally. Um, and if there's a few that kind of get your personality across as well, you would include those at the end, probably three or four max on, on, on that. Well, that's, so that's interesting because you're, you're, you're kind of talking about at the top you have the profile, which is very is relevance to the to the role, and then you're talking more personality and the person and the uh, the softer skills maybe towards the bottom of it. So the structure again being so important in the in the CV. Yeah, you want the facts, the stuff that's going to sell you at the very very top. Do you know what I mean? So the, the the company can say, yeah, this person can do this job, and then everything else I suppose is the the added extra. So on to um, the bad CV. So you would be surprised. Um, we do still get bad CVs in and people maybe don't give too much thought to them. So some of these are very obvious things, but I think it's just important to run through it today. Um, spelling. 
you have to check your spelling. So I think there's really no excuse with Word. You have spell check there, but give it to somebody else to read it for you as well. It's a, it's a great way for somebody maybe to, to, to spot a few things that you haven't spotted. From a perspective of photos in Ireland, we don't really include them unless a particular company asks you to. Um, and then obviously the contact details are all there on this particular CV. But if you look at this email, it's not the most professional. Um, the best type of email address is probably first name dot surname at whatever dot com um, but try and keep it as professional as you as you possibly can um, check spelling obviously as i said already um, there's a number of, of spelling issues on this particular one the exam results this is something we get asked a little bit about as well i suppose it's not relevant to necessarily include all of your exam results what's the most recent is the most relevant so this individual obviously is acca qualified so they're an accountant i would actually have moved that up above the um, leaving search results because the leaving search or the college results aren't as relevant anymore. So again, for college and leaving search, it's enough to give kind of probably a rounded figure. And then maybe with the ACCAs, if there's anything particular that they want to highlight on that. So again, it's looking at what's most recent first and really just keeping it to the, the, the summary of what the results are. The other point on that is be honest. We've had cases where people maybe round up exam results or you know that maybe they're too lazy to actually go and check them. And they kind of go, oh, I think I've got a 63% or 64% in that. If you're not 100% sure, do not put it on your CV. Um, majority of multinationals will check every exam result that you list on your CV. They will go back and look for transcripts. And if there's any discrepancy there, you could actually miss out on the job. So again, if in doubt, leave off the result or else just contact your university to get your, your um, finalized grade. Um, again, gaps, ensure that you're explaining them. And then obviously keep the same font and formatting throughout. Bullet points are a really good way to highlight your key skills. It's really easy for the, the company to read the, read the bullet points. Um, so it's really what we would suggest, maybe a line or two to explain your role and then bullet points throughout. Um, putting the most relevant bits first, we've kind of covered off that. Um, and obviously choosing one pronoun and sticking to it. I think writing it in the first person is the best way to do it, um, to be very honest with you. So that is it. Um, any questions on that, Gordon? So uh, I think it's it's obviously to just to kind of sum, summarise that up. I think people can maybe sometimes think oh, it, it will be fine. The traditional Irish uh, approach to it, oh, it'll be fine. But as uh, Brightwater, as we're consultants, we kind of sit with uh, we work with candidates and we also work with clients and employers. This is something we see, hear back from them. They will not look at a at a CV that is is badly presented. They could be the most um, they could be the most fantastic person and they could be super qualified, but a, a CV tells a thousand words. If you don't take the time over this, um, employers won't look at it. Exactly. I mean, it's the first impression the company is getting of you. Um, in in any job, attention to detail is hugely important, no matter what you're doing. And this is this is that. Do you know what I mean? So if you if you do have spelling errors, if you do have things incorrect, um, it also means that in the interview, the conversation is very disjointed if they can't follow through the, the the CV correctly. But you would be very unlikely to get an interview if your CV isn't strong enough, because the competition out there is just so, so strong at the moment. One thing I didn't mention actually is how to save the CV. So again, just sort of a technical thing. Um, typically we would have done it in Word in the past. However, um, a lot of companies now have a preference for receiving CVs in a PDF format. And that means that nobody can actually change your CV or anything else once you've sent it. Um, and I would save it as your first name dot surname um, when you're sending it over to the client as opposed to some random um, save title for it. Um, and again, the two pages or more, ideally you should, if you're only kind of in the five to six to seven years experience level, you should be able to stick to two years or two pages for, for a CV. However, if there is more detail and you need it to stretch it to three, if you're more experienced, it's not the, it's not the end of the world, but the ideal is probably two, two pages. And as I said, sort of very simple, easy to read font. So if there's no other questions on that, we might move on to the next piece, which is the social media profile. Um, and I suppose this is something that, again, is hugely popular. I suppose about 85% of professionals are now using LinkedIn. Um, so I would advise everybody to actually have a have a LinkedIn profile. And no more than the CV, take a bit of time to actually do up your professional, pro uh, your professional profile. Include all your experience, as you would on your CV. You, you may not go into as much detail, but it is important to kind of include all your experience and you do write the profile at the top as if you would on the on the CV as well. 
use a professional photo um not really a platform for you know having a photo with your dog or your cat i would i would keep it to something similar to a headshot you would probably have for for your work um tag that you're open to opportunities so this is sort of a setting on your actual profile if you are looking for work if you have this setting chosen it means that recruiters or hr professionals will actually find you so LinkedIn is a great thing for you to actually have active in the background if you're kind of passively looking for a new role um, and you will actually find that people will get in touch with you about opportunities that match your skill set. Using the keywords is what's really important to get that open to opportunities tab working for you. So things like if you're an accountant, obviously your qualifications, maybe if you're in IT, it's particular systems um, or programs that you've used. But using those keywords that are relevant to your industry will ensure that recruiters or hiring managers can find you and can contact you about potential jobs that would that will sort of suit your skills. And make sure you connect. I suppose that's the thing with LinkedIn. The more connections you have, the more people will see you, the better it works. So connect your I suppose your network, your colleagues, your old college alumni, your old school alumni. Um, I would I would really try and increase your profile in that sort of space. Um, and other than that, on the social media platform piece, I would keep it professional or keep it private. So nobody's going to really discriminate against you or they won't say they'll discriminate against you. I suppose if they see something that they don't like on your Instagram, if it's a public profile. However, I think it is important to probably keep that private or keep it professional. Um, and make sure that you're not kind of doing anything that's going to create a negative impression of your of your actual self. That's probably is important, isn't it, uh, yeah. Emer, that the the term social media, well, it depends on what you're, if you are actively looking for a job, a LinkedIn profile is almost like your virtual CV. So if you're, if you have pictures of kittens and posts and the posts you put up on it, um, will people will form or employ potentially will form a view because you're saying multinationals checking college degrees you can be sure that the, one of the first stops is going to be um is going to be from uh is to your linkedin profile yeah no definitely and actually another thing to note when i say about being open to opportunities and, and using the keywords the flip side of that is if you do have a fairly niche skill set you could be inundated with recruiters or you know other people contacting you about potential jobs that don't really match your skill set so i suppose what i would say in that in that sort of space is just to partner with one or two specialist recruiters that you're happy to be in touch with you don't need to actually get back to everybody who contacts you on email or in mail um you know you don't want to be sending your cv or allowing your profile to be shared with multiple employers if you don't know where it's going so i suppose again it is important to very much manage your profile in that way um you don't actually, actually have to contact everybody who's in touch actually, with you. we have a question that's relevant to here as well so um just a question coming in um i won't uh, sometimes we these it actually is the open to opportunities visible by your current employer so you can you can check that so that it's not however um when you set up the profile first if you have it on it it's fine they may see I, i'm pretty sure your current employer doesn't see it that is a question that it's not me i'm thinking i'm thinking it doesn't i think they did change the settings recently but we can double check that um and go yes, back no, to no, that individual. I, think, I think i think that is i think that is it's um you notice the green bar uh, open on the linkedin yeah. profiles at pictures at the moment so that is it is definitely removed from your current employer and i think what i would say about it is a lot of people actually have that they're open to opportunities the whole time on their profile regardless of whether they are or they aren't um but i'm pretty sure your current employer doesn't doesn't see it but we can't we can't double check it um and regardless of whether you're open to opportunities or not, I'm sure recruiters will probably contact you. But if you are very actively looking, it can help, obviously, to, to kind of fast forward the process a little bit. So moving on from, from there, I suppose now we're at the point where we're making the application. We've got a really good CV. We've got a really good LinkedIn profile. So we're ready to, to, to hit the market. So first of all, research and apply to the roles where you have suitable skills only. Do not spray and praise. That's a phrase I suppose we, we have internally in terms of with your, with your CV, but you don't want to be just applying to any job. You want to ensure that you're applying to the jobs that are going to be suitable for you and companies that are going to be interested in your profile. It is really, really important. Um, some companies have different kinds of application processes. They want you to fill in maybe an online application process. They want you to send their CV. Some others will want you to send a LinkedIn profile. Ensure you do whatever they ask you to and follow it step by step. You should, if you're using an online portal for, for a company, um, you should actually get an email to say that your application is complete. So some of these online portals can be, you know, three, four, five 
pages long, as well as attaching your CV. So make sure you go through each of the stages and you do hit submit um, at the end of it, but you'll always get an email notification to say that you've, you've done that. Um, LinkedIn applications versus email cover letter and CV. I suppose I would always veer on the side of using your CV where you can, as opposed to just using your LinkedIn profile. Your CV is more of a personalized document. You've got way more information in there. Um, and the majority of companies would have a preference to see your full CV as opposed to you just sending them a link to your LinkedIn. Other companies do advertise their roles via LinkedIn and it's fine to share your profile in that instance. However, if you're applying directly to a company to um, a HR manager or hiring manager's email address, I would always send the, the full CV. Um, another thing when you're making the application is to use your network. So find out if you know somebody who works for a particular company. A lot of firms will run referral schemes whereby employees will actually receive a small bonus if they do refer somebody who's suitable for a position. Um, and if nothing else, your connections, your friends, your old colleagues might be able to give you a little bit of advice on making the application, even give you a bit of advice on maybe what to include in your profile on your CV. Um, so I suppose, again, just use your connections, use your network. And again, I suppose when you're speaking to a recruiter, they will always advise you to tailor your CV towards a particular role and might give you a few po points on maybe how to reorganize your experience to match what that particular company is looking for. So that is probably all on making the application, if there's no other questions on that. Um, Emer, just uh, would there be any, if you're trying to break into a new industry, um, okay. is there anything you should be doing differently on the CV other than making your um, experience relevant to the role that you are applying for? Is that the kind, is that the kind of number one tip that, you know, when you're trying to break into a new, new industry, um, that uh, if you were... Uh, say a sales and relationship manager in one in vertical but you wanted to move into something else um that your how would you how would you tackle I think, something I think, like that i think you've probably answered the question there i think it's looking at okay i'm a sales and relationship manager in one industry maybe i want to move to a different industry so what have what skills do i have that are going to be relevant to that new industry that are going to be relevant to that particular company um and I suppose in that sort of instance, it's great to be able to speak to somebody to sort of say, am I mad? Will the company look at me? You know, how, how can I get a foot in the door? So again, speaking to an expert, either recruiter or even somebody maybe who works for the company will help give you that advice. It can be difficult um, to, to swap and change in terms of, of that. However, it is done all of the time. So it's just a matter of maybe looking at, okay, let's go through what I've done in my past life. Is there any connection here to that new industry? And then really highlighting that on your application. And I suppose honesty as well, you know, when you're making your, when you're sending through your email and your cover letter, be very upfront as to this is what I'm doing at the moment. However, I'm really passionate about whatever it is. And I'm really interested in moving into this industry and in particular your company. Flattery goes a long way in these sort of situations as well. So, you know, I think that honest approach as to I'm looking to change, this is why I'm looking to change and these are the skills I can bring. Um, if the company's open to it, they certainly will progress with your application if you're very straight with them like that. So Good. moving on from, from there, um, so the, the, the theoretical side of, I suppose, interview prep. Um, number one, research the company. It may sound fairly simple, but I would advise not just looking at the company website, research their products, their services, their um, any kind of recent news articles, look at their senior leadership team, have they had any change in management, look at everything you can to really, really kind of engross yourself in what this company is all about. It's important to maybe understand the kind of culture they have, the kind of ethos they have. I suppose there's a huge amount of companies now being very focused on environmental and sustainable issues. Anything like that that's a talking topic that can really demonstrate I suppose when you go into the interview that you can really demonstrate that you've done your research. You want to research the role and how you're going to do that is almost like a join the dots. So take your job spec, take your CV and cross reference where you can bring your skills into that particular job spec. Know your CV inside and out. I can't stress this one enough. This is where probably the highest number of people fall down in interviews. If you don't know your dates of when you've changed jobs, if you don't know your exam results, if you don't know if you've included, let's say if you're in sales and you've included certain targets that you've achieved or different things like that, if you can't actually remember those and talk through them, it really comes across very, very poorly. So you do need to spend time actually really going through your CV and making sure you can speak about it inside and out. And finally, research the interviewers. So that's again, something that's probably a little bit different for some people. 
LinkedIn is a great way to do that. Um, or sometimes, you know, companies have their senior team on um, their senior team or their leadership teams bios up on the website but it's nice to be able to see do you have anything in common with those people that are interviewing you maybe did you go to the same university um, maybe you worked in the same place or maybe similar qualifications to them but it'll give you a little bit more confidence if you know a little bit more about the people you're going in to meet ahead of time um, I suppose competition is really high in this space at the moment Gordon so I suppose anything you can do in that space ahead of time is really, really important. And you can be damn sure whoever you're competing with in the interviews will be doing it. Um, and again, this is where your recruiter will really help you in terms of what you need to do to prepare. So the interview prep for remote interviewing. So this is this is something that people are really interested in at the moment. Um, as I said, I think we're at about 95% of our, our clients actually interviewing remotely at the moment. Um, and I think people got up and running on this very, very quickly. A lot of companies were doing it anyway, um, already pre-COVID. Pre but the first thing, and these are really, really simple things, but you would be surprised how many times people can get these wrong. So number one, technology. Familiarize yourself and download whatever the technology is. So it's typically Teams or like we have today, GoToMeeting, Zoom, but there's a few other different types of software that clients will use for interviews. So ensure ahead of time, you've tested it, the password works, the links work you have picture and sound, um, and ensure that you've got a contact number in case you do have an emergency, maybe there's a problem with your Wi-Fi or whatever. Ensure that your Wi-Fi is running up to speed and a really simple thing that your laptop is actually charged. Um, if you're dealing with an internal hiring manager, or HR manager, or even if you're working with a recruiter, a lot of the time they may be open to testing all of this with you the day before or maybe a couple of days beforehand. So again, there's no harm in asking that question to make sure that you're, you're comfortable with the technology end of it. You don't need anything else to make you any more nervous before, before you go into your interview. Then I suppose you and your space, um, have your laptop set up somewhere quietly where you're not gonna be disturbed, where the Wi-Fi is good. If you're in your family home or I suppose if you're in a house share, make sure that the other people in the house actually know that you're doing something that's really important for the next hour. Do not disturb me. Don't be shouting in the background. If you've got a pet, leave them outside the room so the dog's not barking at the birds in the background. But just ensure that the space is going to be good and quiet and professional for you. You can use notes. Um, so you could have a copy of your CV handy if you want. But what I say is don't let that distract you. Dress professionally, and I would say top and bottom here. Um, I'm a great woman for, for wearing my comfy trousers underneath when I'm on, on a Zoom call, but you do feel better about yourself if you're dressed professionally, and you tend to, I suppose, portray more of a professional image, I think, when you're fully dressed in your, in your full suit or whatever it is that's applicable to your industry. Check that the background looks well. I suppose make sure you're not fidgeting or distracting or clicking with a pen or different things that can, can kind of make, I suppose, interference over the call. So. A lot of information there, but it's very simple. But if you do get it right, you can actually have a really, really successful interview process, even though you're not doing it face to face, you're doing it remotely. And Emer, would you ever recommend that people practice? Yes. Yes. So actually, that's the, the next slide, Gordon, I think it is, is practice, practice, practice with the likes of this, especially if it's over Teams or technology you can use, you know, do it with one of your friends, do it with... I don't know, your partner, whoever it is, practicing and speaking it out loud, especially when it comes to trying to give examples of previous experience that you have. If you're doing a competency kind of interview, it's really, really important to do it. If you don't have anybody to help you with it, you can even record yourself and watch it back. Or traditionally, I suppose, pre all the, the technology we used to use, we'd often advise candidates to actually sit and look in the mirror and, you know, have the conversation that way, which was which was which is a great way to do it as well. Yeah, um, it's like so. It it hasn't, you know, the the interview the interview hasn't changed like that. Those kind of fundamentals of interviews haven't changed. It is about being professionally dressed. It is about looking the part and being confident and trying to sell yourself. And again, in that kind of almost traditionally Irish thing of trying to be underplay in that overly humility. If you know, because we we see it all the time when we when we see um, when we get feedback from the um, the employers and from the from the candidates. It's the candidates that sell themselves that they, yeah. you know, that they 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 exude the confidence in it. The body language is sharp, um, and it looks like they've always that they've already been working there. That kind of um, an attitude is. So what, what do they say? It's like ninety percent of what you're saying comes from. Um, yeah. Only ten percent of what you're saying comes out of comes out of your mouth. 
Yeah, and it's kind of that idea of fake it till you make it. I think if you're dressed and you look the part, you will actually be that little bit more confident in your body language and in actually what you're saying then as well. Um, the other few tips and tricks we have here are kind of similar to that, Gordon. So it says be on time. Even if it's a remote interview, you would be on time if it was a face-to-face -face interview. So factor that in. Be ready 20 minutes, half an hour beforehand. Have your water ready. All of those things. Be dialed in maybe four or five minutes before the actual time to make sure everything's working for you. You know, give yourself that that time to do it so you're not in a panic or there's nothing that's going to throw you off be alert I suppose it depends on what works for you um you'll know from sitting beside me in the office Gordon I'm a big coffee drinker before I had this presentation this morning I had a very strong cup of coffee that's what gets me going other people it's maybe going out for a run whatever it is but do something that's going to make sure that you're you know you're 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 buzzed up you're ready to go and that you're really going to be your best self for the following hour 30 minutes to an hour that, that the interview will be um you know if you've had a really long morning or you know you have a deadline at three or four o'clock don't book an interview for five o'clock you know do it maybe first thing in the morning if that's your best time and if the if the company can be flexible with times um be prepared so this is kind of back to what we we just chatted about there there's all sorts of different kinds of interviews. So you've got competency interviews, you've got maybe more technical interviews, you've got some that may just be a conversation about you and your background. Um, so again, ahead of booking that interview, speak to the HR team, speak to your recruiter, find out what is this interview going to entail? What do I need to do to prepare? If it's a competency-based interview, that's something that's probably we, we see quite common. Um, so that means that you're being asked scenario-based questions. So something like, you know, um, give me an example of when you've uh, displayed leadership or um, demonstrate your communication style or stuff like that. So you need to have good real life examples to be able to highlight the skills that you have in, in, in that area. And it's not enough probably just to think of them in your head. This is where the practice piece comes up, comes up really. Um, it's go through a list of competency questions, answer them out loud. You need to kind of have a start, middle and ending to your to your answer where you're actually kind of giving them what your communication style is, how you've developed it, and why this is a really, really good skill that you've developed. So again, practice, practice, practice. If you're working with a recruiter, I know most of our team will always do mock interviews with um, individuals ahead of an interview, especially if somebody's a little bit more nervous. Um, and again, it's down to the competition. You know, you're going to be competing with people who've who've practiced this. Um, you know, so from your perspective, it's really important that you you do put the time in. It's it's that bit of preparation that is going to make the difference from you getting the job and you not getting the job. If you've been called to an interview, they obviously feel on paper you can do the job. So it's then your job to lose if you don't actually sell yourself during the during the interview. So taking that time is what's what's hugely important. And then the last thing there is, I suppose, be transparent, honest, and upbeat. I suppose be yourself. It's difficult over the remote setting to sometimes get too much of your personality across. But regardless of that, this is these are people you're going to be working with. These are going to be your new colleagues, your new line manager. You need to be able to kind of bond or develop some relationship with them and feel they're people you're going to be able to work with and equally they you. So I think it is important to kind of get that personality across. Um, and that's where obviously things like the hobbies and the interests on the CV can be really nice conversational starters. Is there any questions on that one? Actually, we got a lovely uh, comment in from the group, um, and it was just about to be prepared for if your tech it lets you down. The one thing, the difference between working remotely now and uh, being in the office, you can't physically disappear, but you can do that with technology and to have that backup in place. So um, one of the comments we had here was that um, the switched from a laptop to the phone the phone failed but then had the laptop ready to go as a as a backup and still got off with the roll yeah and i think that's really important i think have the phone number of whoever it is that's managing that interview for you i think if your technology lets you down everybody's human we've all been on calls where you know somebody's dropped out of it i think we we say ourselves everybody seems to be on mute constantly when they're when they're trying to talk in our own team meetings you know people understand everybody's learning this new environment and you are reliant on wi-fi that can drop so I, w I, I would always have the phone number of whoever you're, you're actually speaking with online and ensure that you can ring or you can send them an email if you've dropped out for a minute. Most likely they'll give you five or 10 minutes to, 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 to maybe reboot and, and jump back in. Um, so yeah, there's absolutely no problem with that. And again, I mean, it's all about being human and kind of getting your personality across and sort of showing how you handle things that may go wrong. Things go wrong and work. If you can demonstrate that you don't get completely flapped by that, it's actually a really good way to, to kind of actually show them another skill that you have. Um, 
So finally, the interview pitfall. I think this is the, the second last slide at this stage. So something you mentioned earlier, Gordon, as well, it's short, limited answers. It's people not being prepared to have the examples to really give detailed answers um, to the questions that they're being asked. Yes and no don't really belong in an interview. You need to be really able to flesh out your answers and really sort of sell what you've done in the past that's going to be relevant to this new role. Um, answers lacking real life experience. So again, this is where maybe somebody overly prepares for a competency-based interview and includes some examples that not, that's maybe not relevant to actually their own job or that's not fully honest. You want to be using examples that you fully understand that you can talk through in detail that really highlight why you're really good at your job. Simple things like, you know, if you were nominated for an Employee of the Month award or if your input to a particular project meant that you achieved a deadline a day ahead of time, all of the things that I suppose you may take for granted as simple things that you're doing in your day-to-day -day role, but they are the important bits to, to, to really get across when you're, when you're doing your preparation. Avoid the use of internal jargon and acronyms. Um, when I was working in financial services, this was something that used to come up a lot. So there's a lot of jargon and ac acronyms in the industry itself. That's fine. Everybody understands them. But there's some that are actually just innate to a particular company. So if you're actually talking about your experience, think about the words that you're using you could be describing something using an acronym that maybe the interviewer doesn't understand. And equally, if they ask you a question with an acronym that you may not have heard before, don't be afraid to actually double check it with them because it could be an internal phrase that you actually haven't come across and they may not be aware of. Um, and I suppose the main feedback that we do get from everybody interviewing out there is that the individual sold themselves short. They didn't practice enough. They, didn't, they weren't able to sort of demonstrate how they had the right skills for the role even though perhaps in the background they do. Um, so I think it's, it's all about that preparation ahead of time. And finally, closing the interview. So I suppose if you've got through the 30 or 40 minutes or sometimes an hour, an hour and a half, maybe depending on who, who you're interviewing with, um, this is a really important part of the interview. I can't really stress that enough. You're, you're going to be slightly probably running out of steam at this point. Um, but it is really important to have a few good questions prepared for the interviewer at the end. You know, sometimes it's very simple things that you can ask. But what's important is, I suppose, is that you're really giving a good last impression. So simple questions, you know, what will the first three to six months be like in the role? You know, how many people are on the team? What kind of systems do you use? Keep them very simple, but have a few pre-prepared so you're not kind of thrown if they ask you that question at the end. Do you have any questions? Um, maybe what is the onboarding process like? Sim really, really simple stuff. Um, be ready to discuss your salary notice period and availability to start. So it may or it may not happen. A lot of the time at first interview, they were not going to ask this question. But if they do, it's important that you're ready to be able to answer them. You need to be honest. You're not going to lie about your salary. But you do need to be able to explain what your notice period is, what your bonus, what your benefits are. So you do need to understand how your package is made up. And that probably involves looking back at your contract that you might have received when you started work. Notice period is one that's quite important because if you have one month notice and you're in an interview process where maybe two or three of the other good candidates have three months notice, you will be able to start sooner than them. And it actually means that maybe the, the, the particular employer will be keen to move quicker on the, the hire and therefore you may actually be the preferred candidate just down to the timing on it. So little things like that are, are, are really important to, 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 to be prepared to answer. Ask about the next steps. Um, if you feel the interview went well, this may sound a bit cheesy, but tell them. As I said, we all love a little bit of flattery. Um, so I think if you really want the job, if you felt the interview went well, if you feel this is a company you can really add value to, you know, say that at the interview and definitely thank them for, for, for their time at the end of the, at the, end of the session. Um, a lot of the questions we actually often get asked are, around this is kind of, you know, how long should I wait for feedback? Um, you know, what is the process like? So at least if you've asked that question, you should have an indication that if they say to you, you're, they're going to get back to you in a week or two weeks, you know, it's okay to start chasing them for feedback after a week or two weeks. If you don't ask the question, you don't know how long it's actually going to take. So again, it's important that you've invested your time in actually taking time to prepare for the interview, that you understand what's expected from you in the coming, coming stages. Um, so either for the next stage of the process or for when you'll hear the positive or negative news. So I think that's probably it, Gordon, on my end. Um, it is a topic I could talk for hours on, but that's the high level. Yes, yeah. just, yeah, conscious of a couple of, of uh, people's time as well. It's been really, really, um, really, really enjoyable. And thank you very much for your uh, time, Emer. Um, question um, around interviews. Um, okay. 
getting great feedback um, from the interviews, um, came across very well, did a really good interview, but still losing out to people who have more experience. What would you suggest to somebody like that? Um, there is always going to be, uh, so I think there's probably a perception around when you get an interview that you, you're definitely going to get the job. There probably has to, there's, there's going to be, an, um, I suppose, that resilience around it as well and not getting disheartened by it if you don't yeah, get I the job. And it can be really disheartening, especially if it's something that you really feel, you know, you nail the interview on. Um, I would always ask the the, the question of the, the the company that has interviewed you. So if you're going either directly or again via recruiter, you know, either ask the HR or the hiring manager directly or ask your recruiter to find this out for you, but do push to get feedback. So if you've just been pipped to the post and there's very little in it, sometimes that's the case. But I would always ask the question, is there anything I could have done more in the interview? Was there is there anywhere that you can give me maybe some positive criticism that I can use for my next interview? Um, unfortunately, the market is very, very busy at the moment, so there is a lot of competition out there. Um, but I would say if you're getting the interviews and you're being told that you're very close to, to securing the role, you know, fingers crossed the next interview or the next interview you get, you will actually secure a position. And equally, if you're creating that really good impression, you know, that time isn't wasted. You can reapply to a company when the next position comes up and chances are you may actually get it if you if you um, have done so well in the first interview. Yeah, um, actually, as a as a, as an anecdote, I'll obviously keep the the individual and the and the company out of it. But that happened to an ex colleague of mine that he interviewed for a promotion, wasn't given the promotion, and directly followed up and wanted to know exactly why he didn't get the job. Um, and due to the level of his feedback and critiquing his employer on it, um, they actually gave him the job. He got it because he yeah. was the uh, he was the best. He was the they were just they were. Um, pleasantly surprised by his drive to for, for the for to, the role find the feedback. yeah and, and and sometimes it's a case that you know the person who's accepted the role may receive a counter offer something might happen a few months down the road into their notice period so I'd always keep those conversations very professional very upbeat um, and again most hiring managers will be quite happy to provide you that information especially if you've given the time to do a couple of interviews with them and very quickly um Cover letters, we didn't talk too much on that. What content should be in a cover letter if you're um, asked to supply one? So the cover letter is kind of like the professional profile at the top of the CV. Um, they are a little bit of a thing of the past. I think sometimes it's enough to send the CV and almost just have your cover letter in the detail of your email if you're, if you're making your application via email. But if a company specifically asks for it, I would say keep it to three paragraphs. The first is probably going to be an intro, a little bit about you, maybe your skills, your qualifications. Second one is probably why you're interested in the company and the role, what your experience is and how, how you're suitable for that. And then the third one may be a little bit more around your softer skills or, you know, the, the, the kind of softer side to it. So it's short and sweet, but it's it's very much a summary of your experience and why you're why you are the person for this job. Brilliant. Um, now, just having a look through. Um, that seems to be oh, it's one. One question is, but it's it could be quite hard. It's quite um, could be quite hard, but um, we'll have a quick um, chat on it. Um, a few people who are work looking for work, despite their vast years of experience, um, the biggest perception they have is around their age. For people who are over fifty and looking for work, I think one of the and Emer passes over to you in a sec. But one of the key things around that is how you are how you are shaping that experience as an asset that a future that an employer is not not getting um so you can only control um the the cv that you put forward and how you shape that and how you mold that to be that age is a is an is a is an advantage um so one of our one of our uh, one of our um attendees was wondering about how do how do you how do you give advice to people who are who are over 50 and looking for work when they feel that they're not getting roles due to their age due to their age so it is something that does tend to come up from time to time i mean every employer is going to tell you that they, they don't discriminate age sex gender any anything obviously and, and companies are very very i suppose forward thinking in terms of their process um i suppose it was probably at 
back in when I was recruiting probably in the financial services sector when when the banking crisis hit that we had a huge number of sort of senior managers maybe that were made redundant that were back out in the market some of them having worked with with some of the key banks for maybe 20 30 years and never worked for a different organization and really working with those individuals um, at the time I suppose I, I learned a huge amount about how recruitment processes work but I think the idea is you know sometimes it can be a chip on the own individual shoulder so i'd say first of all don't be don't be thinking about your own age i would say definitely what you've said there gordon look at your experience how can you mold that experience to fit whatever the new organization or the new company that you're applying to um and and how can you add value to them sometimes it could be a case that some of the job titles or some of the experience that you have on the cv can actually be a little bit daunting um, you know, you may have been in a more senior role before, but now you're happy to take a, a slightly less challenging position or a slightly lower level role, if, if that's the case. It's important probably in that instance to actually have a really good detailed cover letter to explain that. Do you know what I mean? Um, because sometimes it can be a little bit, oh my goodness, that person's a senior director somewhere. This is a management role. Sure, it's not, it's not suitable for them because of the level of experience that they have. However, if you've really detailed it in your cover letter as to why you're interested, it can it can come across very, very well. So um, it's case really by case, like, it's difficult really to like know with the I really industry. Like approach, I really like that approach yeah. though, Eamon, where you have a cover letter where, so your CV can be quite a static document where a cover letter can be quite fluid and you can yeah. you can articulate nicely to say, oh, this and I have all this experience, but yes, I understand I need to come down um, or come back the, uh, the, the levels a little bit, but I really want this, want this role. Um, yeah. Okay, guys, so I think um, just conscious of everybody's time, it's been a very, very informative um, 40, with two minutes over, which is, uh, which is, which is great. Delight, delighted with that. Timekeeping is, is, uh, is something we all need to keep, keep an eye on, as, as Emer, um pointed out earlier. So I, first of all, I want to say thank you to Emer, uh, Emer Walsh. Um, uh, she just, that is just, you know, it's great to have that experience and be able to, uh, to leverage off of that. Um, and I hope everybody found that um, insightful, found some little bits and pieces in it and um, some takeaways from it. Um, we will be in touch with a link to the slides and a uh, and a and some uh, some email addresses that if you want to get in touch and you want to have a few more questions that we, we're not able to get through uh, through this to, today. Um, so I would encourage everybody to please get in touch um, and we would uh, be delighted to help you wherever we possibly can. Um, so listen, have a great day. Thank you very much to everybody. Um, have a nice lunch and hopefully we will hear from you soon. Thanks a million.